The Carpenters Ministry presents this refreshing and life-changing teaching. We trust that this message will be a blessing to you. Blessed be the name of Jesus. We give you all the glory and we give you all the praise this morning. In Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Amen, church. Are you happy today? Why not look at the person by your side and welcome them to church. Give them a smile. Look at the next person by your side and give them a smile. Tell them, I see you flourishing. I see you flourishing. Amen. Glory to God. All right. Are we ready for the word this morning? All right. Can we turn to Galatians chapter 6, verse 6 to 10? As we're building up for our seed week, I want to share something that will help us prepare our hearts, not only for seed week, you know, prepare our hearts in the area of giving generally, but seed week is an opportunity for us to tap into uh, an opportunity that God is giving unto us. So Galatians chapter 6, verse 6 to 10. Let him who is taught the word share in all good things with him who teaches. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. He who sows to his flesh will of the flesh reap corruption, but he who sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. And let us not grow weary while doing good, for in good due season we shall reap if we do not lose hearts. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all, especially to those who are of the household of faith. So Paul here is discussing about a sower or about a giver. If you look at in our text, you find out that the word giving is the concept of giving is used interchangeably in that text. If you look at verse 6, it refers to it as sharing. In verse 7, he talks about sowing. Verse 8, sowing. Verse 9, doing good. All right, and he talks about the return on doing good, which is reaping. And then in verse 10, it tells us to do good again. Another reference to doing good, though a different good Greek word, but the same idea. So Paul is undeniably speaking about giving. And in verse 7, what is the word that is most used in these five verses from verse 6 to 10? What is the word? Sow and reap. So we can say uh, conclusively that this text that we read is speaking about what? Sowing and reaping. I want to talk to us this morning on what I have dubbed, titled, Some Characteristics of a Sower. Some Characteristics of a Sower. I didn't say the characteristics. I didn't say characteristics. Some, because this is not elaborate, this is not exhaustive. But I believe from this context... It's, it's, it's some of the high, major highlights uh, of what Paul is discussing. So a sower is one who gives. If you want to write that simply, uh, what, who a sower is. And in this context, sowing is synonymous with giving. Like I've said, the word share, doing good, can be used interchangeably for the word sowing. And they all refer to giving. So Paul is speaking here about giving. Who is a sower? That's another question you could ask. Who is a sower? One of the ways you can know who or what a person or thing is, is to define its characteristics, is to look at the features of that thing, and that will let you know if that, what that thing is or they are what they say they are. So I want to share three things with us this morning. Paul is talking about sowing and, of course, what follows it, which is reaping. You find the word reap or the word sow and reap in verse 7, verse 8, and verse 9. So it is clearly what Paul is speaking about. So what are some things we need to know? Three things I want to lay on our hearts this morning. Number one, a sower knows the importance of sowing. The, a sower knows the importance of sowing. Can you say that after me? A sower knows the importance of sowing. Look in our text, verse 7. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. 
For whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. So he starts by saying, look guys, I don't want you people to be deceived on this subject. Now, no, observe that Paul didn't start his discourse in verse 7 by saying, by saying in verse 6, he says, let him who is taught the word share in all good things with him who teaches. And then in verse 7, he says, for whatever a man sows. So he's showing us that sharing with the one who teaches you, that is giving to the ministry or the minister from which you are fed, is an act of what? Is an act of what? Talk to me. Sowing. So giving is sowing. But Paul doesn't just start by saying, uh, he who is taught in the word, share with he who teaches whatever a man sows. He puts a caveat before he gives that, repeats that universal law of sowing and reaping. What does he say? Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked because whatever a man sows, he will reap. He's letting you know that, look, this is a law that is inescapable. This is a law that is inviolable. That is, if you violate this law, there are consequences or there are returns on doing so. And we live in a world today where people are, you know, denying this law. People are vilifying this law. People are probably saying, don't think that you can increase God's way and neglect this rule. Are you following me? Re neglect this principle of sowing and reaping. So to think that one can reap without sowing, listen, is an attempt to scoff God. That's why Paul says, do not be deceived. God cannot be what? Mocked. In other words, if you're expecting to receive an increase from God, with, now let me quickly say, this is not the only way to receive an increase from God. But this is one of the fundamental ways to receive increase from God. You cannot receive increase from God the way God wants you to receive it if you totally desecrate this law. And Paul is saying, if you do that, you are scoffing God. Do you know what that word, uh, uh, God cannot be mocked, that word mocked means to scoff. It's almost like, when, you know when somebody says something and you don't believe what they are saying, or you, you look down on what they are saying, when they say what they... When they finish saying it and they turn their back, you, what do you do? Do what you do. Yeah. Or sometimes in the presence of the person, hi, hi, you do like this. That's what it means to scoff God. So God says, what a man sows, you will reap. You say, hi. That is, you have figured out in your mind another way to increase without obeying this principle. That's what he's saying. So Paul is telling us, that God cannot be mocked. Now, in this context, Paul is talking about sowing and reaping. Observe that when people use the law of sowing and reaping, in what way do they normally use it? Negatively, okay? Like in what area? Leave the context we're discussing about now. Whatever a man sows, that will he reap. There is a law in the world people refer to this as. What is, who knows that law? Karma. Good. And Christians also preach what you sow, you will reap. When they say it, in what case do they normally use it? Negative, that is. If you, do, if you commit sin, God will catch you. Rem Sorry? Some bad thing will happen to you. Or some even know the verse that says, your sin will find you. You all know the verse. But should I shock you? This passage is not used. The law of sowing and reaping has two primary uses in the New Testament. Number one, sowing the seed of the word of God. Number two, giving material things. There is absolute, there is actually nothing in the New Testament that says what you sow is what you reap in terms of you have committed sin, therefore God is going to punish you for that sin. Now, there are consequences to actions. Consequences to actions, however, is not necessarily God punishing you. Can I have an amen? You're every, all your mates are preparing for their exams and you, you are sleeping. You are watching TV. You are next flixing. You are pr uh, watching movies. You are enjoying yourself. And it's time for the exam. You now begin to pray. Quote scriptures. Lord, you will bring all things to my remembrance. Yes, he will. You will bring the Netflix and the Google you have been watching. You will bring it to your remembrance. You go into the exam hall. Your mates are getting A. You get D. Or you get D. D-E-E-D. -E -E 
or you get a de e d e and say it is not my result i reject it i invoke the favor of god come on get a life you are reaping what you are sowing in the sense that you are receiving consequences it's not necessary that god is punishing you who is punishing who you you are reaping the seed of your foolishness but in the new testament sowing and reaping is primarily used for sowing the word of god matthew 13 mark chapter 4 uh luke chapter 8 the sower sows the word and according to second corinthians 9 according to galatians chapter 6 it is used in respect of sowing material things and receiving a harvest that is the true law of sowing and reaping in the new testament can you say amen so why do people vilify? Why do people disobey this law? Let me give you a few ideas. Number one, because they do, they do so, people do so, because they think that everything is in God's hands. Everything is in the hand of God. So if everything is in the hand of God, then what you sow does not matter, right? Because everything is in the hand of God. God is in control of everything. Who has heard that before? Uh, you know, God is sovereign. There is a false teaching of the sovereignty of God today, which is that God will do whatever he wants to do, whether you do something or whether you don't do. Who has heard that before? You know, God is sovereign. That means God can choose to do what he wants to do. But like we have been taught in church, God's sovereignty is only for good. Amen? And God's sovereignty is at his behest. It is at his, it, 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 it's based upon what God chooses. So God can choose to do something. God may not choose to do something. But if God chooses to do something, what he chooses to do, glory to God, we know it's going to be good. For instance, I could come up on stage here, you know, or preparing for the service, God could give me a word. I did not manufacture the word. God gave me the word. That is the sovereign move of God. Are you following me? So somebody could be healed of a condition. Somebody could get direction. In church, there would be more people who have conditions. There will be more people who need direction. But the word may go to one or two people. You say, why didn't God minister to those other people? I don't know. But he chose sovereignly of his own behest to manifest himself to those people. That is the good sovereignty of God. However, God has given us principles in his word. Truths promises in his word for us to build our lives upon and if he says whatever a man sows he will reap it says to me that God has honored me God has honored you in being a co-participator in the events that happen in your life it's not all upon God look at second corinthians chapter 9 verse 6 so everything is not in God's hands we bear some responsibility uh second corinthians 9 verse 6 says that but this i say he who sows sparingly will also reap how sparingly that word sparing means stingily and he who sows bountifully or with generosity with blessings will also reap how bountifully so who who is the who has the responsibility there who has the responsibility it's you so everything is not in God's hands. So we can say to an extent, if this is the law of sowing and reaping, the principle of sowing and reaping, where you are financially today or materially today is partly or um, even maybe largely, uh, largely tied to your obedience or your disobedience of this principle. You know, sometimes you need to hear something that will sober you up. Because somebody, sometimes somebody is prospering and other people are vexing at the person's prospering. And they say things like, is it who, I mean, you know, it is, uh, are you the one that created the person? Who says whether a person will have? Who says whether a person will not have? Who has said that before? It is God who determines. The person has because God says he will have. The person who doesn't have, does not have because God says he will not have. That is not totally correct. I know that God can, God can place a grace on somebody to make wealth. I agree. God can... Grace, place grace upon a person to be in certain places or influence agreed, but that your needs will not be sufficiently and abundantly met and that you go without is never and it is not God's will and you have something you can do about it glory to God, so that is one reason, another reason why they believe this, why people disobey this rule, and I'm talking about Christian people, is that similar to what I just mentioned, is that they believe that whatever will be, will be 
Whatever will be, will be. It's close to what I just said. But this cannot be the case. Because again, logically, listen, if, a, if, I, if he says whatever a man sows, that he will reap, that means I can determine to an extent what I reap. By what? By the, what, the seeds I sow. If that is true, that whatever will be, will be. You know, God will bless anybody. Whoever is going to be rich, will be rich. Whoever is going to be prosperous, is going to be prosperous. Whether you do anything, whether you don't do anything. That would be like a farmer having five he he hectares of land. And stand, he stands in the planting season. He stands in front, front of his ground that has been mowed, ready for sowing. And he just looks at the ground. And he drives in his tractor and says, whatever will be, will be. Whatever will be, will be. And then he says, then he goes home. And after the planting season, he comes to his farm. And he expects to reap a harvest. You, do you understand? How will we dis designate such a person? The guy is, the guy is crazy. We'll, wash, we'll rush him to the, uh, to the intensive care ward. I mean, the site of the psychiatric hospital. There's something wrong. That is bonkers. There's something wrong with him. He's not thinking straight. Well, that is the same way. You know some of the things we believe if we just pass them through the test of logic, not even scripture, just logic, many of them will fall. So it means that whatever will be, will not be. That is uh, you have something to do about it. Look at Proverbs 20 verse 4. Proverbs 20 verse 4. The lazy man will not plow because of winter. Now, look at what he says. He will beg during harvest and have nothing. The lazy man will not plow. That means he will not prepare his ground and he will not sow his seed. So, what happens during harvest time? He will go to his field and will he find something there? He will find nothing. Why? Because he did not plant his seed. And because he didn't plant his seed, he didn't have a harvest. And because he didn't have a harvest, what will he do? He will beg. He will become a victim of the circumstances. So friends, whatever will be, will not be. God, in giving us this principle of sowing and reaping, has empowered us with the power to, pros to prosper. Can you say amen? In giving us this law and principle of sowing and reaping, he has empowered us to prosper. Another reason why people disobey this principle, this is an interesting one, is a warped understanding of grace. A warped understanding of grace. What, are we, what is our key verse? Galatians 6, 7. Whatever a man does what? Sows, he will reap. You know, there are people when they hear, when they hear anything like sowing, you know, in so, some years ago, I think it has settled down now, there was this teaching that came out against giving. How many of you heard it? I mean, tithing, sowing, and, you know, in a bid to correct some things, I don't even know if that teaching was corrective. I think it was more, it confused more people. But sometimes in a, in a bid to correct something, people go overboard. Kenneth Hagin always says, let us always stay in the middle of the road. Don't swerve to one side. Don't swerve to another side. And even when you are correcting something, be careful that in correcting, you don't go off to the other side. Because people who, came, who, who claim, who tout themselves as having a revelation of grace, of course, you know, grace and works are incongruous, right? For by grace have we been saved through faith. And that not, uh, uh, how does Paul say it? And not of works, right? It is the gift of God, lest any man should boast. So you can read that verse, and it is true that grace and works are incongruous. But for what purpose? For the purpose of salvation or, or remaining saved. Your works did not save you. Can I have an amen? And your works ne will not necessarily keep you saved. That's the truth. The Bible tells us that Jesus is able to save to the uttermost those who come to God by him, seeing that he lives to make intercession for them. It is Jesus who saved us and is the one who is keeping us saved. Can you say amen? So when Christians hear works, they say, oh, you are putting me under bondage. And you will agree with me when you hear sowing. Sowing sounds like works. You are doing something. You know, the way some Christians feel is that now that you're saved, you're on a perpetual roller coaster and God will do every smooth cruise control. You know, I don't need to do anything. I don't need, we don't need to work. No, God is not against works. In fact, if, there is, if, there were, if people didn't work, you'll not be saved today. 
Because the ministry is called the work of the ministry. The Bible talks about ministers who labor in the word and doctrine. In fact, every form of service in the body of Christ is some form of work or the other. So God is not against works. What God is against is the inspiration behind the works. And Paul goes on to tell us in this context that the kind of sowing God is interested in is he that sows to the spirit, not he who sows to the flesh. So sowing here cannot be a work of, of, of legalism. Because there are Christians who hear that. They say, don't put me under bondage. God, in fact, some have said things like, you know, God is your father. You don't need to beg your father for something. You don't need to, must you sow to receive something from your father. It sounds logical, but the Bible must be kept cohesive as one. It is the same God that said it. It is in the same book where, God, where Paul treated legalism that Paul talked in whatever a man sows, he will reap. Do you know your Bible? You know your Bible that much. Where did Paul address legalism? There is no other place Paul addressed legalism than in Galatians. And in this same book, he's ending his book and he says, whatever a man sows, he will reap. So sowing and reaping does not go against the spirit and even the principle of grace. Can you say amen? But there are Christians who feel like this and that is one reason why they desecrate this inviolable law of God. Like I said, sowing and reaping are not the only means of increasing from God. Now write this down. God provides the seed, but we sow it. God provides the seed, but we sow it. So knowing how vital sowing is, the Bible tells us that God ministers seed. Can you put up 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse, that would be verse 9. Verse 9, yes, I believe it's verse 9. I'll read it later on, but from a different version. Can you put it up? 2 Corinthians 9, verse 9. For as it is written, he has dispersed abroad, he has given to the poor, his righteousness endures forever. Next verse, verse 10. Now may he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food, supply and multiply the seed you have sown and increase the fruits of your righteousness. So he, who is the one who supplies the seed? God. But God will supply the seed, but listen to this, God will not sow the seed. God will not sow the seed. There is nothing in this passage that shows that God sows the seed. Nothing. Nothing. The only thing in this passage is that God leads you to sow. But God does not sow it, the seed for you. And God does this because he knows, listen, why will God minister seed to the sower? God will do this because of how important this principle is. So if you identify yourself as a sower and you say, Lord, I don't have anything to give. This seed week that is coming, Lord, I want to give sacrificially. Lord, I want to give generously. I want to be a part of what you're doing. This new budget year, financial year, Lord, I want to be part of what you're doing. And you say, but Lord, I really don't have anything. If you are actually sincere and true, you know what God will do? He'll give you seed. You didn't hear me. I said he'll minister seed to you. The problem many times is that God ministers seed to us, but we are overwhelmed with our needs. You make a commitment, Lord, bring this money. And before long, through some business deal, through alat, halat, or whichever way, God ministers, that money comes to you. But at that same time, there is a need that is staring you in the face. Please, let me ask you, is there anybody here who, you, I mean, at some point in your life, there are, not, there are no needs? Are there always needs? Are there always needs? So it means there must be a way that God has designed for us not to deny our needs, but to prioritize him, put him first and sow our seed. And if you are in that situation that you really don't have anything, the Bible says that God is the one who ministers seed. God is, as I was thinking about this, this uh, yesterday, this is a thought that came to me. It's like God who needs an investor. But the, and you are that investor. But you don't have any money to invest. You know, there are companies, foreign companies, if they want to do business in Nigeria, there must be local participation. That is our law. Good. So, 
somebody wants to invest and they want to choose me as their partner. But for some reason, I don't have the money, the millions to invest. So the person says, you know what? Don't worry. I will give you that money. I will dash you. You will invest it. And the returns will be yours. Normally, if a person gives me money, kind of like fronting for him, when the interest comes, we'll do the normal signing of the paper. But behind, this is what lawyers do. Behind, we'll sign another paper. <laughs> that that money uh, is not really my own, but that person's own. The person who, the benefactor. But God doesn't do like that. God says, you are a sower. So really, what defines a person as a sower is their attitude. And you can't deceive God. If in your heart of hearts, you want to give to the work of God, God will locate that heart. God will recognize that heart and God will bring seed to you. And when he brings seed to you, listen, it now becomes a test for you. Will you do what God brought it into your hands to do or will you do it and spend it on yourself? Can you say amen, church? So God is like that investor. So write this down. Increased harvest is primarily forgiving again. Increased harvest is primarily forgiving again. We're talking about knowing the importance of sowing. If you look at 2 Corinthians 9, we read before, I'll read it again, but from the English Standard Version. He says, as it is written, he has distributed free, freely, he has given to the poor, his righteousness endures forever. Now look at verse 10. He who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply. Look at this. Your seed for sowing. Your seed for sowing. When God brings increase into your life, for what primary purpose is it? For what primary purpose is it? It's for you to give more. Listen, I believe, I am not there, but I believe that God wants us to so prosper that we live off very little of what we have and we give most of what we have. Some people, some people are scoffing, like I said at the beginning. I said, Pastor, you're your own. I'll repeat it again. I believe that God wants us to so prosper that we live off, what did I say? Very little of what we have and we give most of what we have to his work. If people who don't know God can resign from their businesses and spend the rest of their life, like Bill Gates, am I, am I correct? Spend the rest of their lives in charitable works these are people who, are, who, don't, who have not professed Christ then how much we who know Christ God can so prosper you and notice what the verse says that he increases when God brings the harvest let me read it again he says he will supply and multiply your seed for sowing seed for sowing he multiplies your seed sown so that you can have bread to eat and you can have seed to sow again. But between the bread and the seed, what does God want you to do more? Eat more bread or sow more seed? I ask you a question. Some of you are struggling with that. But I ask you a question. A farmer, when they farm and they receive uh, a harvest, which one do they eat? What, what do they do with their harvest? Do they eat more or they sow more? Talk to me. The Bible identifies you as a sower. So it means that with God, you can progressively get. See, we're talking about giving abundance. Some of you are even struggling with your tithe. They say, ah, I beg, I don't believe that tithe. No, God wants you to get to where you can give most of what you have. Can you say a good amen? I am not there yet, but I'm moving. I'm not where I used to be. Yes, I'm not where I used to be. I've made gradual movements and progress and it will only get better. And that, can, and that can be your experience but it all starts with you determining in your heart that you will be a sower. So number one, the sower knows the importance of giving. Number two, another characteristic of a sower is that they, he or she is spiritual. Is spiritual. 
look into our text again. Galatians 7, 6 verse 7. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. Verse 8. For he who sows to the flesh will of the flesh reap corruption. But he who sows to the spirit will of the spirit reap everlasting life. Now, for many years, I must be honest, I struggled with this passage for many years. Because verse 6, I know, verse, seven, verse 6 talks about giving. Verse 7 talks about giving clearly. Verse 9 and 10 talk about giving. But I had a struggle reconciling verse 8. Because the context is speaking about what? Talk to me, church. What is the passage talking about? Giving. So when Paul talks about sowing to the flesh, sowing to the spirit, what is he talking about? What is he talking about? He's still talking about giving. In other words, what I thought for many years is that in verse 8, Paul went on an excursion and then came back to what he was talking about. But he's saying the same thing. He's still on the same subject. Verse 7, whatever a man sows, what does he say? That he will also reap. Verse 8, 4. 4. That is, he's still building on what he said. He who sows to the flesh, it means that when you sow, you are either sowing to the flesh or you are sowing to the spirit. Or more literally, you are sowing to your flesh or you are sowing to the spirit. So this tells us something. That giving is spiritual. Sowing is spiritual. It's getting quiet in this good news church this morning. It's one of the pastor Charles says that if you want to know if somebody is spiritual, look at what they do with their money. You know, if I look at your bank stubs, it can tell me a lot about you. If you print your bank account and we take a look at it, it, can, it says a lot about you. Your spending patterns say a lot about you. Whether you say it or not. If I print my bank statement and I show you and you sit down and we go through it, you will know whether this pastor is just talking or he's leaving what he's saying. It says a lot about you. And giving is one of the things. You know why? The Bible calls money the least of these things. And God uses the least of these things to gauge if you are spiritual. In other words, what you do with the least will tell a lot about your spirituality. M giving is spiritual. You know why? It follows the example of God who loved the world and he gave his best. Giving is spiritual because it follows the model of Jesus Christ who gave himself for us. So it means that if God is in you, if you are impelled by the life of Jesus and you follow his example, you are going to manifest that same thing that Jesus Christ did. So write this down. The believer has a decision whether to sow to the flesh or to sow to the spirit or to sow to his flesh, I should say, or to sow to the spirit. So I want you to understand that verse 8 is still talking about giving. So in the context of giving, Paul gives us two options, which is sowing to the flesh or sowing to the spirit. Now, here's the thing. Everybody sows. See after me, everybody sows. Everybody sows. You, so what is the difference? It is the location of where they sow that differs. He who sows to his flesh, he who sows to the spirit, everybody sows. It means if you come for this seed week and it's time for us to sow, time for us to give, and you don't give, we will say in a sense you have not sown. Follow me carefully. But according to Paul, you have actually sown. Everybody sows. You either sow to your flesh or you sow to your spirit. Let me ask you, how do we know what it is to sow to the flesh or what it is to sow to the spirit? Well, what is one feature of the flesh that contradistinguishes with the spirit? The flesh is generous, right? Is the flesh generous? What is the flesh? 
Selfish. In fact, one of the main characteristics of the flesh, if you are going to use one word, what is it? Selfish. The spirit, on the other hand, in the context of giving, what would you say the spirit is? Generous, what's another word? Selfless, what's another word? Sacrificial. Are you beginning to see it now? Are you beginning to see it? Let me give you examples of what it means to sow to the flesh. When someone sows to the flesh, it means that they will either not give or what they give will not be sacrificial. That's sowing to the flesh. Why? Because when you heard that voice of God telling you to give, or when the opportunity presented itself towards you, you say, no. Say, I beg, that money, we have kept it for a rainy day. That money is for a project. So when, the moment you say no, and that no results in either A, not giving at all, are you following me? Or B, giving, B, giving less of what you know you should give, guess what? You have sown actually. But where did you sow to? You didn't sow to the spirit. You sowed to, notice what Paul says, to his what? To his what? His flesh. In other words, you kept that for a selfish desire to meet something selfishly. That's what Paul is saying, sowing to the flesh. So I said, you're, uh, you're not sowing or you're not giving or you're not sacrificially you're giving. Here's another one. You refuse to respond when God prompts you to give. Now, let's all be honest. Uh, this has happened to me before. So, if you don't want to confess me, I'll confess. I know there are times, this has been many years ago, this doesn't happen now, thank God, that God moved upon me to give something and I refused. Do I have a witness? Is everybody here, whenever God moved upon them, they said, yes, Lord, I am your obedient servant. No, talk to me. Some of you, are as you are looking at me today, some of you are still refusing. When God moves upon you to give and you don't give, what have you done? done? Now, in a sense, you have not sown, but in the real sense, what have you done? You have sown. But where did you sow to? Your flesh. Your selfish desires. They say, ah, no, God, 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 no, no. If you want to bless me, Kukuma, bless me. If it is this thing I will give you that you used to bless me, I know, do I beg, I beg. You begin to preach message to God. Here is another one. Not even perceiving God's signals for you to give. You know, people say things like, God never speaks to me. You know, that is not true. God speaks to all of his children. However, this is the danger in not responding to God. When you stop responding to God, it's not that God stops speaking to you, but you develop a callous on your heart. You know what a callous is? How many of you have been injured? What's a callous? Doctors tell me. You know, and it is some, something that makes you uh, say, speak the grammar for me, that makes you unfeeling. To stimuli, you have to talk it, Pastor Derek. That makes you what? Insensitive, thank you. So there is a kind of hardness on your skin, on the layer. And normally if you take a pin and you pinch, let's say it's on your, on your, on your finger, you pinch one finger, you, you know, you, you, you feel the pain. When you place it on a callus, what happens? You don't feel it. You don't feel it. You become unfeeling in that area. You know, when God speaks to you, when the Spirit of God moves upon you over and over, you know, if there's an area of your life God is dealing with you with, or he has dealt with you with over and over and over and over, and you don't respond, you know what God will do? You know what he'll do? He'll leave you alone. He'll leave you alone. He'll come back because he's merciful, but the danger in refusing to respond to God is that you develop a callous. Pastor can preach whatever she wants to preach. Pastor Shola can preach whatever he wants to preach. And say what they want to say. You say, oh, Lord, they'll just be saying, watching time. Oh, service is over. I thank God it was a great service. But God spoke in that service. God was even tapping the door of your heart. But you didn't hear. Why? Because you've, you know, not listened to God over and over again. Here is another one, which is still about sowing to the flesh. 
is giving emotionally. That's so into the flesh. Giving emotion. Ah, but Pastor Shola, you said uh, 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 not giving is so into the flesh. No, the flesh is also stingy. The flesh can be generous sometimes. It will surprise you. But what is the motive behind it? Are you following me, church? What is the motive? Paul said, if I give my body to be burned and I don't have love, it profits me nothing. So it is possible to give your body to be burned. It is possible to give yourself to be killed, but your motivation is not by the Spirit of God. That's very sad. And there are people who do it a lot. They give. You know, but it's emotional. It happens in church all the while. Somebody gives to this person, somebody gives to this pastor, somebody gives to that. Somebody. You look at it and you say, this is emotional. Say, how do you know, Pastor Shola? I know. And you too, you know sometimes. Somebody comes with a sad sob story with, to you, he weeping and wailing and wailing, and you open your checkbook. You don't know when you open your checkbook or when you do the halat of some heavy five figures or handsome six figures. But the church has not seen five figures of your money. Says the Lord that moved upon you. Well, I'm not the Lord and I'm not in your heart, but I know the principles of God. If Paul says, let him who is taught of the word, do what? Share. It's in the present tense. Be sharing with him who teaches. Listen, your primary place, that should, the primary place that should receive your finances for the work of God, if you're a member of this church, I say it without any equivocation, my eyes are open, my senses are screwed, spiritual and otherwise, it is this place. Pastor Shola just took a book, an amen from his invisible bucket this morning. <laughs> Here's another one. Always giving as you have planned. Listen, if you always do everything in your life the way you planned it, you are, you are not involving God. I say it categorically. I said this some weeks ago. I don't know when I was saying it. If you're a singer, you always sing the song you planned to sing. You are coming to the stage 10 minutes or after you've rehearsed, once in a while, God doesn't move upon your heart to change that song. There's something wrong. You are not giving room to God. If as a preacher, you're always preaching the message you planned, you're always following the notes to the jot and the tutu, you are not involving God. What am I saying? God is dynamic. And every now and then, God will move upon you to go over and above what you have planned. Sometimes he will even tell you to drop it. Amen, church. A brother shared the testimony. I'm always refreshed when I refer to that testimony. It's one of our departments here. He said that some years ago, maybe like three or four years ago, there was some money he wanted to give. And he had planned to give everything. And God told him, give this one. <laughs> and he wanted to give it again. God told him, mm-mm. It is the one I told you to give, which is less in quantity, much less. That's what I want you to give. You know, sometimes we, we have the spirit of bravado. We want to overdo. I know you can't outgive God, but listen, God knows where you are. God knows your level. And God will always move you, but he will not move you beyond your level of accumulated spiritual development. Did you get that? He will not move you beyond your level of accumulated or developed spirituality. When I was in primary school, I used to go to, for swimming every Friday. I believe this, if memory serves me well, the senior students in my primary school. And of course, in the swimming pool, where do you think everybody swam? The deep end or the shallow end? Ah, beaucoup de la vie. Pastor, did I get the French? <laughs> Everybody was will be there, fooling around, messing around. The people who can swim don't swim in the shallow end, though. <laughs> they will just dive in from the deep end. It is sleeping, Oof. and that is where swimming is sweet, not the one where you can be touching your feet on the floor. If they'll be holding the railings, hey, hey, pouring water. Hey, hey. You are not a swimmer. You cannot swim. Get out of the water. <clears throat> But our swimming coach, still remember him, Mr. Robinson. Now, he's our coach, so he observes us in the swimming pool. He knows those whose level of development has passed the shallow end. So you know what he will do? He will come into the pool unbeknownst to us through the deep end. 
and he will lock your feet in that middle area where you are playing. You don't be wondering, ah, something is holding me. Is there octopus in the, in the swim? And he will drag you and he will either raise you and throw you into the deep end or he'll unlock himself in the deep end. Then you stop doing like this. Yeah! Yeah! Before you know it, you start paddling the same way you are paddling in the shallow end and you find, find out that you can actually do it in the deep end of the swimming pool. What did Mr. Robinson observe? He knew that your level of development was beyond where you are. But without a gentle push, without throwing you into the deep end, you will not develop. So what he did was to throw you there. And when you got there, the same things you used to do in the shadow end, you begin to apply them there in the deep end, and then you are able to swim. Do you know that is what God does? Because for many of us, if God doesn't give us a nudge to go over and above the board, what we have always been doing, we'll keep on playing it conveniently. And there are many of us who are playing it conveniently. You have been giving the same offering you have been giving all these years. Inflation has come. We know how things have doubled or tripled in the last number of years. Talk to me now. Don't get quiet on me. You go to the supermarket. You know, just now, before, when I just go to pick a few groceries in the supermarket, spend 3000 you know, two, five. Now, just to pick one thing, two things, three things, the money is almost 10K. I said, God, what is happening? So, if the consumer, as consumers are collecting my money, good measure, pressed down, shaking together, then why is it that it is the kingdom of God that is receiving least. And listen, God always leads us counterintuitively. Counterintuitively. So when things are difficult, when things are hard, guess what? That is when God will tell you to move and increase your giving. You have an opportunity this seed week to give like you have never given before. You just missed a place to say amen. <laughs> I'll say it again. You have an opportunity this week with all that is going on in the world, with all that's going on in our country, with the change of government and the different policies which we don't understand. You have a key to plug into God's system that does not fail. Don't sow to your flesh because if you sow to your flesh, you are going to reap corruption. Death, sowing to your carnal desires, is sowing into a sterile system that cannot produce. Barren. But sowing to the spirit is sowing into a system that will generate life for you. He says, uh, he that sows to the, his flesh, we love the flesh. Rip corruption, decay. More decay. But he who sows to the spirit, what will he reap? Life. Why? Because the spirit produces life. Paul said the carnal mind is life and death, but the spiritual mind is, sorry, the carnal mind is death. To be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Another word for peace is prosperity. So when the Holy Spirit comes into operation and you sow into the spirit, you are led by the spirit, you sow into the realm of God, you sow into the economy of God, you place your resources into a full, into a fail-safe system which is bound to come back with a harvest for you. Amen. I will say amen to that. So being spiritual, write this down so I can go to my last point. My time is up. Being spiritual in giving is expressed, write this down, by being flexible in your giving. It's also expressed by recognizing the principle of priority. That's in verse 10. I don't have time to go into that. This is another one. By discerning opportunities to give. By discerning, what did I say? Opportunities. Paul goes on to say in verse 10, as we therefore have opportunity, let us do good to all men, especially those who are of the household of faith. Opportunities. That word opportunities, the Greek word kairos, a word many of us know. Let me ask you a question. Listen now. Do opportunities always come announcing themselves? 
Do opportunities say here, for instance, here I am, I'm an opportunity. Sometimes they do. Many times they don't. Kenneth Hagin made a statement years ago. He said many Christians, even if the Holy Spirit were, I don't know the exact words, he, colors he used, but the paraphrase is, even if the Holy Spirit wore loud colors, red, a red jacket, green chinos or trousers, orange boots, lilac hat, he's so loud, I'm the Holy Ghost, so I'm the Holy Spirit. Many Christians will miss him. Many times God is pre presenting opportunities to us, but we are not discerning. Being spiritual in your giving, in order to sow to the Spirit, you need to be discerning. Remember that Shunammite woman? The prophet was passing by her house. She said, I do what? Perceive that this is a holy man of God that passes us by. Let us, make it, let us be giving him food. The prophet wasn't begging for food. She said, come in. She fed him. After a while, she upped her game. She said, ah, you know what? Let us build him a loft. It doesn't mean let us put him in the boys' quarters. Boys quarter, so. Let's not put him in a small room. No. A loft. The Hebrew word aliyah. In the east. In fact, let, why are we going to the east? Um, but when you go to a story, a, a skyscraper, which office? Uh, uh, oh, you have answered it. That top floor. If a building is out for that block of flats is out for letting. Do you agree with me that the topmost one will cost more? Oh, you, you bet it does. That's what that woman did. She built him a penthouse. Luxury apartment. Her giving was progressive. Her giving was spiritual. But how did it start? Let us, let us, let, this is a man of God that passes us by you. Just a casual, that was revealed to her by the spirit of God. Can you say amen, church? So a true giver, one of the earmarks of sacrificial giving, sorry, of a sower, is that a sower, a true sower, is spiritual. And write this down. One reaps, one sows, one reaps in, from where they sow. One reaps from where they sow. I've already alluded to that. But just to give it to you for conclusion. Galatians 6, 8, John 6, 63. All right, let me give you my last point and we'll end. So what's number one? What's number one? A sower knows what? The importance of sowing. Number two is spiritual. A true sower, sower is spiritual. And number three, a sower is consistent. Is consistent. Look into our text, verse six. Let him who is taught in the word share. In present tense, that is active present. That is let him be sharing in all good things. The word taught is also in the present. So as long as there is a teaching going on, what should there be? A sharing. Okay. Now look at verse 9. Verse 9 shows us, uh, in fact, this passage shows us words of consistency. Share, that's in verse 6. Not grow weary, verse, uh, what's that now? Verse 9. Due season, do not lose hearts, and as we have opportunity, all these different terms carry the idea of consistency. Due season. That is, there is a time that your harvest is going to come. So, what are we seeing here? The very idea of being a sower implies one who gives by lifestyle. Say lifestyle. And practice. Say practice. It's just like a farmer. Because you have a small garden behind your house, and you go and buy boots, and you know, you buy rakes, spade, hoe, all of those things. You think you're a farmer. You're not a farmer. At best, you are a glorified gardener. How many of you here play football? You play football. Lift your hands now. It's only Omina. Omina, okay, maybe that's why you cut your hair the way you did. Because you want to. Raise your hand if you play football. You play football. Ah. Bros, you too, you play. Good. How many of you played yesterday? I know there are some of you on Saturdays now, you like to feel you are a footballer. You, you, have, you, have, you have the kit, Seth. 
you know, you have, you have uh, what they call them, the, the, the shoes. In fact, you even buy long socks. You buy, the, you have the shorts. You even put your name, Kanu, Shola, number, number, whatever. And you come out with your big belly. Oh. For your mind now, you are Kanu Wakwa. For your mind, you are, what's this Argentinian man? Messi. For your mind, you are, you are your best footballer. And you are going like this. We are going to play ball. Be not deceived. You are not a footballer. Don't kid yourself. It's good for the comic relief to enjoy yourself, to keep your blood pressure low, to flex your body. That is good. But be not deceived. A footballer thou art not. You're a ball tapper. Is that field, you small field, is the place you even play the ball. It doesn't qualify to be called a football field that you visit every weekend or every other weekend. We are going to play ball. We are juggling. We are going to play ball. You are not a footballer. The footballers invest 10 years of their lives. They have wounds. They have surgeries to show that they are footballers. They give their best, but that, those period of years, they, in the, all their life, they are playing football. They're exercising. They're eating. They're on regiment. They're exer- they play matches. If they're not playing matches, they are training on the field. They do it as a lifestyle. They have high moments where they invest more. They have other moments where they don't invest as much, but they are always in the process of strenuous training, strenuous delivery. That is who a sower is. You are not a sower because you gave some some sacrificial money once. In fact, somebody who gives a regular amount consistently, consistently, consistently is a greater sower than the person who just wears his clothes on Saturdays with his big belly. We are going to play ball. You You get the analogy? you don't remember anything in this message, you remember this one. <laughs> so it's one who gives as a lifestyle. Ecclesiastes says, cast your bread upon the waters. After many days you find it. Give a serving to, one, to seven and to eight, for you do not know what evil will be on the earth. Constantly. 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 Oh my God. Let's just lift our hands and thank God for his word. Blessed be the Lord's name. Blessed be the Lord's name. A giver is one who gives, a sower is one who gives consistently. And when you give consistently, due season will come for you. And I believe that due season is is here for some people. I believe due season is round the corner for some. In the name of Jesus. 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 For some of you who have been given and you've, you've not thrown in the towel, God says to say to you, due season is here now. Due season is upon you. And due season always comes to the one who always gives and does not lose heart. Father, we thank you today for your word. We thank you today for your word. And we thank you for this seed week that is coming. This seed week is an opportunity for you, church, to plug in to what God is doing. To tap into the resources of God. To tap into his abundance that he's been talking to us about. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. We give you praise today. We give you glory. We bless your name. Thank you, Father, because you found in us. Lift your hands, church. You found in us people who are faithful. People, by faith, we declare that we are sowers. We are sowers. We recognize your principle, Lord. We are spiritual in doing it. And we are consistent. We are committed. We are sold out in the name of Jesus. To you be all the praise and to you be all the glory. In Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Every head bowed, every eye closed. No one looking around this morning. You're in church this morning. You're not born again. You don't know Jesus as Savior and Lord of your life. If you die today, you're not ready to see God your maker. If that is you, can I see your hand up? You'd like to be born again. To have a relationship with God. Through Jesus Christ. Can I see your hand up? 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 If you're watching online and you'd like to accept Jesus as Savior and Lord, lift your hand up and put one hand on your chest and say these words after me. Say, Father God, I come to you today in the name of Jesus. 
I believe that Jesus died for me and you raised him up for my salvation. Jesus, save me now. I make you my Savior and my Lord. Thank you, Father, for saving me in Jesus' name. I'll pray for you. Father, I pray for as many persons that pray this. I declare that now there are new creations in Christ. The old is past, the new has come. And from this day forward, they walk in the newness of life. Thank you for a new beginning for them in Jesus' name. Amen. If you pray that prayer, congratulations, my brother and sister. Welcome to the family of God. Kindly follow the prompt on your screen, on your screen, and somebody will reach out to you and will be glad to serve you. Amen and amen.